I've titled the sermon, Yes, God is Able. We are living in a fallen world. And as we live in a fallen world, full of fallen people, we have circumstances that come into our lives that are beyond our control. Maybe you're newly married and you're yearning for a child and you've been praying for a child for many years and nothing seems to be happening. Maybe you have gone through miscarriages and this is your fourth one or maybe your fifth one and you don't know what your next is going to be. Or maybe you're watching your loved one die of stage 4 cancer. Maybe you're on the brink of financial collapse. Maybe your spouse is abusive towards you and your spouse is unloving. And it has been over two decades that you've been praying for your spouse faithfully and regularly and, and nothing seems to be happening. Maybe you're praying for your unsaved child and you've been praying for years and there is no light in sight. And as you listen to this passage today, you may have mixed emotions. Now you may say, wait, wait a minute. How does all this make sense? My beloved, this passage that we're going to hear today may not make any earthly sense to you. We are limited to our human perspective. We, we think we will be happy if we have everything that we ask for or everything that we pray for was granted, we think that would be perfect. We think that a perfect sunrise or a perfect sunset in our lives would totally change our lives forever. Only if we had a better job. Only if our health was good. Only if our spouse was a little more caring. Only if my children were saved. Only if I did not have that cancer. Only if I did not have to suffer injustice for so long. And then we are continually fasting and praying for these circumstances to change. And you do not see any hope in sight. And you hear the sermon on Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I want you to know, my beloved, that God is almighty. That God is on the throne. That our God is a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a God who is not limited by your wisdom or your perceptions. Our God promises to do immeasurably about all that you would ask or imagine. And as you wonder if God is able to help you today, even as you're seated here in this church, the Bible's answer is yes, He is able. Before we look at the passage, let's take a quick review of the passage from last week. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. We saw three petitions in those passage, in that passage. The first petition is the one that's seen in verses 16 and 17, that according to the riches of His glory, that He would, be, he would strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner man. To the end, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Paul is praying that God would strengthen your inner man with power through his spirit. And as your inner man is strengthened, Paul states that Christ may have complete dominion and control over your life. 
And then he continues into verse 18. He says here that you be rooted and grounded in love. And that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul is referring here to the dimensions of Christ's love. The breadth of Christ's love includes all people from all of eternity. The Jew and the Gentile. People from every nation, every tongue, every tribe. It reaches around the world. The length of Christ's love extends from eternity to eternity. From before the foundation of the world to the end of the ages. We read in Jeremiah 31 verse 3 that I've loved you with an everlasting love. The height of Christ's love refers to us being seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are exalted in the throne room of God. The depths of Christ's love extend to the fact that Christ stooped down, became man, he humbled himself, even to the extent of suffering on the cross, so that you and I can be saved from the deadness of sin. And Paul here is letting us know that the only way you and I can understand the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love for the church is when you and I are rooted in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Meaning, you and I need to be rooted and grounded in love, but the problem is you and I cannot be rooted and grounded in love unless and until you and I have known the love of Christ. Meaning you have to be born again from above in order to know the love of Christ. You have to be saved. You have to become a believer. And how do you become a believer? By trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. By recognizing that you are a sinner, re repenting of your sins, saying that Christ, yes, Christ died for my sins on Calvary's cross. He became the propitiation for our sins. He, he turned the wrath of God away from us. He became sin for us. So that we might have the righteousness of God. And when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, God imputes Christ's righteousness to you. He seals you with the promised Holy Spirit. And you become a believer. You have eternal life. And now you are able to be rooted and grounded in love because you are now understanding the love of Christ. Paul's third petition there is found in verse 19b, and that is that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That's something that we grow into each day. Paul is praying that we be filled with this characteristic, with all of his attributes. He wants us to be more and more like God each day. Not as incommunicable attributes, but as communicable attributes. His attributes of holiness, righteousness, goodness, love, mercy, compassion, loving kindness, long-suffering, faithfulness. And how can we have the fullness of God? It is through Jesus Christ. It is through the indwelling of Christ in our lives. It is through the Word of God that we have the fullness of God in us. We read in John chapter 14, verse 23, He said, If anyone loves me, he will come, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and will come to him, and we will make our home with him. That's Paul's prayer. And that's what we said last week. I said, we need to be praying for our congregation. And I gave you this challenge, I gave you this commitment. I said, go home, make this commitment to yourself that you'll pray for this congregation. And there are three things I told you to pray for. And this we got right out of our passage in Ephesians chapter 3. That you'll pray that you will be strengthened in your inner man. In other words, the other people will be strengthened in their inner man. That they will be rooted and, they will be rooted and grounded in love. That they will be able to understand the fullness of God. Or that they will know the fullness of God. Three things to pray for. And this is what you can do as you pick up your bulletin this week and as you open it up and as you remember the congregation that you can pray for your congregation this prayer. Now, let's come to the passage at hand. 
Let's come to chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's children say, Amen. This is one of the great doxologies in the Bible. Martin Lloyd-Jones calls this doxology as the grand doxology. This doxology in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 is a hymn of praise to God. It's Paul's remarkable prayer that he began in verse 14. This doxology is the climax of this great prayer. There is no greater prayer than what he is going to say in verses 20 to 21. It's an address to God. It is he is so moved by what he said in verses 14 through 19 that Paul bursts with praise to God in verses 20 to 21. He's bursting with this desire to praise God, to thank God, to glorify God. It's a triumphant declaration of the glory of God. As one commentator said, Ephesians chapter 3, 20 to 21 is the Mount Everest of the entire book of Ephesians. And if you look into the context, as Paul is writing Ephesians chapter 3, 20 to 21, he's in prison. What better place to be in as he's writing this book? And you'll know that because he, he says that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He says that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20. It says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul is under house arrest. He is uncertain about his future. But despite all these uncertainties, you find here is a man bursting forth with a great hymn of praise to God. He's praising God, he's worshipping God, he's adoring God. He's not a defeated man in spite of the fact that he's in chains. He's praising God despite his circumstances. And we can praise God even in the midst of our difficult circumstances. I have two headings for you in verses 20 to 21. The first one is, my God is all powerful. And look at, let's look at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more exceeding abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Let's stop right there. Paul begins verse 20 with the word now. And this is bringing together all that Paul has stated in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, he's culminating all of that together and he's saying now. The next word says now to him. Who is the antecedent to the word him? Who is the him referring to? The him is referring to none other than God the Father. And he's saying God is the object of our praise. Now to God, now to him. And then he continues, now to him who is able. The word able is a Greek word dunamai, from which we get our English word dynamite. Dunamai, power. God is of such power that God is able to do anything or everything within his plan. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible to God. He's far more able to work on our behalf than what you and I can even comprehend. Paul goes on in the verse, Now to him who is able. Is able is in the present tense. Meaning he is continually able, not sometime in the future, but right now, even in the present moment, even as you and I are here in this church, even right now as you're praying for a specific request to God, Bible says God is able. The next word is the verb to do. And to now, now to him who is able to do, it is the Greek word poiel. Which means to accomplish, to perform, to provide, 
I mean, God is able right now, continually, at this point of time, He is able to bring about or He's able to accomplish. What? Well, there are six things that we see in this verse. Let's look at that. Six aspects of God's ability in verse 20. First of all, He's able to do what we ask. Whatever you ask, he's able to do if it's in his will. He's able to do what we ask. Second, he's able to do what we think. So even as a thoughts in our mind, even there's a prayer that's not uttered on our lips, as we think about it, he's able to do what we think. Three, he's able to do all. Do you see that word? All that we ask or think. Then, if you look further into verse 20, he's able to do beyond all that you ask or think. Then if you go further down in verse 20, and if you look further into verse 20, it says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Do you see how he's piling up superlative upon superlative upon superlative upon superlative? And he extends it all the way to saying he creates a word to express that. It's a compound word in the Greek with prepositions. And he's saying, my God is exceedingly abundantly beyond be able to provide more than we ask or think. I mean, it's one thing for God to answer what we think. It's one thing for God to answer what we ask. I mean, it's another thing for God to answer all that we ask or think. Okay, for God to answer beyond all that we ask or think? Well, that blows my mind, right? But for God to super abundantly or exceedingly above beyond all that we ask or think, that's out of chart. In other words, there's nothing that is too hard for God. No matter what we ask, he goes beyond even what we ask or think. Even in our limited prayers, God has infinite powers to act upon our finite prayers. My beloved, God is bigger than our prayers. He goes over and beyond we ask or think. So even if we hold back from asking something in prayer... God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. Someone said, let us pray big prayers. It's impossible to ask God for too much, assuming that it's in line with His will and for His glory. One writer, Phillips Brooks, said, pray the largest prayers. You cannot think of a prayer so large that God in answering it will not wish you had not made it larger. And he says, pray not for crutches, pray for wings. Our God is able to do immeasurably about what we ask. But you know, friends, I only know to ask what I think is good for my immediate family. Or I think I know to ask only what I think is good for my immediate future. But you know, God knows what is good, not just for me, not just for my children, but for my children's children and their children. He knows, I may be praying for someone's salvation, but he knows how to bring the multitudes of the world to his salvation. Verse 20, let's go back to verse 20. It continues. So here's the phrase that you look so far. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. This is the phrase we want to look at now. According to the power at work within us. The power that God 
uh, that Paul is referring here to is an in, intrinsic power. God's intrinsic power. The power that is within God. And that power that has been given to us, which is delegated power, He delegates that power to us. God has given us the power, and this power, the Bible says, is at, is at work within us. What power is that? Well, turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. And he says, What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The power that we are talking about here is resurrection power. The power that raised Christ from the dead, that power is available to us. According to the riches of his grace, that power, that resurrection power is available to us. He continues, verse 20. He says, according to the power at work. It's the Greek word energio. From we get our English word energy. Again, it's operational power. And by the way, that word at work is in the present tense. That means Paul is saying that according to the power that is, at con- that is continually at work within us. We read that in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to his work for his good pleasure. God is working always in the world. He has always worked and he continues to work and he will work in the days to come. We've seen God's power at work in creation. He brought creation into existence. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 reads this, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, He puts the deeps in storehouses. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 we read, Ha Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth. And he goes on to say, by your great power. God's power created the world. Let me also tell you that God's power is seen in the judgment in this world. We see his judgment in the first few pages of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6 through 9, we see how God destroyed the entire world with a universal flood, sparing Noah and his family. That was his power at work. We see in Genesis chapter 11 how God judged the world by confusing the languages of the people as they were trying to build the Tower of Babel. We see in Genesis chapter 18 that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. We see in Exodus chapter 12, verse uh, chapter 12 through chapter 14, uh, or rather chapter 10 through chapter 12, how God destroyed uh, the Egyptians, drowning them in the Red Sea. And as to how He parted the Red Sea for the nation of Israel to walk through, it was at power and display. And we see in the book of Revelation that one day God will destroy Satan. And not only Satan, God will judge anyone and everyone who denies Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. His judgment. And we see His power in the judgment that is there in the world. God's power is seen in the salvation of lost sinners. The person that comes to mind is none other than Saul. As he was walking on his way to Damascus, a light shone from heaven. And we see in Acts chapter 9, we see in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, that there was conversion there in the life of Saul. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was insolent. He was was a religious zeal. He was brutally violent. But God saved him. And he says, I'm the chief of sinners. God saved someone like Saul, Saul says. And we know that proof of this conversion because Saul was converted, he was transformed, he was regenerated. 
the same power that raised Paul from the dead has raised us up as well. His power is seen in my life as he raised me from my spiritual death. And I know that his power is seen in your lives as he opened your eyes to the truth of God's word. That is God's power. And we see that in display in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Would you please turn there just a page behind. It says, You were dead in the trespasses of your sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That means you are enslaved to Satan. Among for once, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That means children deserving wrath, like the rest of mankind. But you see here the biggest but in the Bible, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy. But God, He was rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He reached down, He stooped down, He opened our blind eyes, He took away our hard, stony heart, and He gave us a heart of flesh. He took away our dead spirit and gave us a new and living spirit, the Holy Spirit within us. Isn't that the power of God at work in our lives? So God's power is seen in creation. God's power is seen in judgment. God's power is seen in the conversion of lost sinners. God's power is also seen in our sanctification. We were justified when we were saved. But God began the work of sanctification. He took away, He, he gave victory over the penalty of sin. When Christ died on the cross, no longer are we under the penalty of sin. He took the wrath of God and He imputed us with our righteousness. But we still wrestle with the power of sin in our lives. Yes, Satan is defeated. But we still have the power of sin. And until we see Him face to face, when the presence of sin will be completely eradicated from our lives, but until then, we have to wrestle, we have to battle with sin in our lives. And how do we do that if not for the power of God that's in our lives? This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, we read, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, his power that is at work within me. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God is actively working in our lives with unlimited ability, unlimited power, and inexhaustible resources to accomplish His will in our lives. He's at work in our sanctification. That's the power of God. God is never inactive in your life, He is never restrained, He is never handcuffed. He's never shackled. He is all powerful. And this should bring comfort to you to know that God is powerful and God is at work within you. The God who created this world, the God who judged this world for their carnality, the God who saved sinners like you and me, and the God who empowers our sanctification is continually at work in our lives, even in our prayers. This should give us assurance and confidence as we go into the presence of God with our requests. But again, beloved, our human requests are feeble and finite. We want happiness when we need salvation. We want success when what we really need is humility. We want safety when what we need is godly courage and holy boldness. And so what do we do? We ask within the limits of our human understanding and comprehension. But the Bible says here, Paul says, God is able to do much more. We only, as I said earlier, we only know to ask what is, we think is good for our immediate family. But God knows much beyond that. God sees into eternity. 
what is needful for our souls and for the souls of those whom our lives will impact. Isn't that what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9? No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. God's greatness allows me to believe in His good will, even when something I ask is not answered, or when I desire or imagine is not answered. Are you grieving over something right now in your life? You've been praying for years? It's burdened your heart? Maybe you're praying for the salvation of your lost child. Maybe you're grieved because you have lost a loved one whom you will never see on this side of glory. Maybe you've been betrayed by a loved one. Maybe you're praying fervently for your marriage to be blessed. Maybe you're battling with sin and you want to conquer that sin. Let me encourage you to see beyond your answered prayer or your unresolved circumstances and look to God who is able to exceedingly, abundantly, more than we ask or think. Please, would you turn with me to Romans 8, 31. Romans 8, 31 and 32. It's easy to doubt God when you go through difficult circumstances, and I want to bring hope to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, speak to me, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for, his, uh, for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It doesn't say some things. He says all things. All things in his will. By the way, we cannot comprehend that. You know why? Because we are finite people. We are finite people with finite needs. And in our mind, we think what we desire and pray for is the best for us in our lives. But God is infinite. And God is beyond us. And God knows eternity, which you and I do not. Are you going through trials in your life? Would you please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And here is Peter writing to those people who have gone through persecution, lost their homes, they lost their families, and they're going through trying times. And, and here is Peter writing to them. He's comforting them. And look at how he comforts them. He says, you are going through these things, yes, but in the midst of all these things, 8 says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied, varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And he says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I'm sorry. I, I, please also read chapter 5. This is what I intended to read. I read the wrong place. First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 6 through 8, yeah. Or 8 to 10, sorry. Scriptures always make sense in all circumstances. Let's go to First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls along like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Even this makes sense, right? In the circumstance that we go through. God is all-powerful. And the Apostle Paul, back in Ephesians chapter 1, he wants you to know that God's power is not in question. Let's lay it to rest once and for all. His ability to answer your prayer is not in question. Let us praise God for His power because God's power is at work in you and me and He will accomplish what He has begun in our lives. Because God is super abundantly able to do more than what we ask in our prayers to God. God knows what your need is. And He knows how to provide for that need. And it is sometimes He provides beyond us. And sometimes it is beyond what we ask and think that we need. My God is all powerful. Let's go on to verse 21. My God is to be glorified. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It begins with, to Him be the glory. When you look at the word glory, there are two types of glory. There is the intrinsic glory and then there is the ascribed glory. Intrinsic glory is what is in Him. In God. Nothing can be changed to it. You and I cannot add to God's intrinsic glory. He's all glorious. The, the God that we see in the Bible is a God who was and is and is to come. He's forever glorious. He's forever perfect. Eternally the same. Unchanging in His glory. We cannot add on to the intrinsic glory of God. It's unaffected by outside forces or circumstances. What we are talking about here, and what Paul is saying is, to him be the glory, he's talking about ascribed glory. That means give him praise. This is what we read in Psalm 29. He says, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So first Paul says here that God is to be praised in the church. To give Him, to Him be the glory in the church. The church is a universal church of redeemed believers. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The church exists to bring glory to God. Wherever God's people meet together, we need to give God glory. And this kind of praise is to be continually offered to God. So whether you are in church, whether you go to work, whether you're at home, whether you're talking to people, whether you're walking down the streets, whatever you do, you are to ascribe glory to God. And by the way, you cannot add on to His glory, you can only declare His glory. And then he goes on into verse 21 to the rest of it, says, To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. We have seen that in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 23 that the church is Christ's body. So the Christ, so when you talk about Christ, Christ cannot be detached from the church. This is why the Bible says anyone who tries to destroy the body, God will destroy him because the church is Christ's body. And we as a body of believers are in union with Christ Jesus. So God's glory in the church cannot be divorced from His glory in Christ Jesus. Anytime we are bringing glory to God in the church, we are glorifying Christ. Because Christ is the head of the church. And God is to be glorified in the church because the church is God's masterpiece. We saw this earlier in the earlier chapters that we are the habitation of God. We are the dwelling place of God. We are the people in whom God dwells. God sent a son to die for us on the cross. He atoned for our sins. 
He purchases out of the slave market of sin. We belong to Christ. And as we belong to Christ, we bring glory to God. God's glory is to be in display, is on display in our church. And when it's on display in the church, it's bringing glory to Christ. So in a sense, as a church, we ought to be bringing glory to God. In the way we relate to one another. In the way we talk to one another. The question is, are we bringing glory to God as a church? As individual members of the body? Are you loving one another? Are you sympathetic to one another? Are you compassionate to one another? Are, are, you, are you forgiving one another? Sometimes it's easy for members within the church to forgive their members of their own family for whatever sin. But when it comes to forgiving other brothers or sisters in the church, they hold back on it. They're not willing to forgive. And is God glorified through all this? But now I wanted to move this from just our relationship to our prayers. How do we respond to circumstances in our lives? Because how you and I respond to circumstances in our lives, we also bring glory to God. I mean, you may memorize the scripture. And if I ask you, and I take a survey of how many of you actually know the scripture, you probably mention the scripture many times. You know it by rote memory. You probably put it on your walls. You have it on your screensaver. You have this down. But what happens when your family is in distress? What happens when your finances are in jeopardy? What happens when there is no light at the end of the tunnel? What happens when there's no respite and no, no deliverance in the manner in which your spouse treats you? What happens when you have been praying for the salvation of your child and there seems to be no answer? Do we still recognize God as sovereign and powerful? Do we still, in the midst of these circumstances, give glory to God? And are we able to say, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations? And you can only do that, my beloved, when you understand the character of God. And what Paul is doing here, what our beloved apostle is doing here, is revealing the character of God to you. That your God is exceedingly, abundantly able to give you more than you ask or thing according to the power that is at work within you. And he says, let us give him all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Cancer will come. Tragedy will strike. Children will be rebellious. Spouses will disappoint. Yet, in the midst of these circumstances, in the midst of these situations, you need to affirm that God is able to do beyond what you can ask or imagine for His glory and for the eternal blessing of those whom He loves. You say, how is that? Well, you and I need to understand it's not our glory here. It is God's glory. That's the big picture. We truly have no grasp of eternity. But God knows what is good for you. I mean, He knew what was good for you. God is so gracious, He did not leave you in us in your sin. If you're seated here this morning, and if you're seated here because you love the Lord, and you're saved, and you're a believer, it's because God was at work in you. He did answer the prayer of someone to bring you to saving faith, exceedingly abundantly more than they could ask or think. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us, will He also not give us graciously all things? This is what Romans 8.28 says. It says, For we know that all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. And when you think about the good, it's not our good. It is God's good. It's God's glory. Would you please turn with me to a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
We may have never turned there for a while. It is there. It comes after Psalms. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Is it in our time? Does it say that? He's made everything beautiful in our time? No. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And then he goes on to say, also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. As we look at our sin-cursed world today, as we look at our lives affected by the fall, all of this appears meaningless. And our prayer and hope is to see meaning in all these things that we are going through. But as we, as long as we live in this world, affected by the sin, we will only see the consequences of sin. But when you begin to understand God's wisdom, when you understand things from God's perspective, you will realize that God has made us for His eternal purpose. And as long as we live in the sin, we will not find true meaning and we will not find true satisfaction because you will only find true satisfaction when you begin to know Him. That's what Augustine said. He said, you made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. So, beloved... I want to kind of give you an illustration. You've probably driven around some large cities. And as you drive around large cities, you see these huge skyscrapers. And you can see scaffolding on them. Have you seen that? And as you see scaffolding on them, you see men working on those scaffolds. And outside is a sign, very clearly, warning people, saying, work in progress. A construction in progress. My beloved, we are all a work in progress. And we are all having scaffolds on us. And God will one day finish us and perfect us and bring us as a bride to the bridegroom. As we see him face to face. At that time, we will all be transformed into the image of his glory. But till then, we are all a work in progress. And that's why now here Paul moves on into chapter 3 verse 21. He says, To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Whatever is going to do, whatever is doing right now in our lives is going to bring Him glory. Not just now, he says, throughout all generations, forever and ever. And if he had more words, he would have said forever and ever and ever and ever. And he doesn't stop there. He says, Amen. Amen. Amen to verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Amen to that. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen to that. And I need to wrap this up in your mind. When you pray to God, and when you're waiting upon God, Focus not on your problems, but focus upon the glory of God. Recognize that God is able to do whatever He needs to do, exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think or imagine. But God's ways are not our ways. You and I will never make sense of it, because unless and until we recognize it's all about God's glory, only then you'll be able to look at your circumstance in your life and find rest in those circumstances. Otherwise, you'll be troubled, my friend. You'll be restless. And you'll be frustrated. And you live in agony. And you lose the joy of your salvation. So find rest 
in the fact that God is in the business of doing what? Bringing glory to you? No. Bringing glory to himself. He's passionate for his glory. And he will do that. Gaze upon God's power. Praise God. So that you and I would be able to sing. Unto him be the glory forever and ever. And all God's children say, Amen. Father, we are delighted, Lord, as we come into your presence, even recognizing that we are finite people. And we don't make sense of all these things right now. There are times I know, Lord, I myself have been frustrated because I've been praying for some things in my life and I've never seen the answer yet. And Lord, I continue praying and sometimes I lose hope and I said, I'm not going to pray for it anymore. That's not going to be answered anymore. But Lord, I confess my sin. I know, Lord, that you are much powerful beyond my ability, Lord. Beyond all that I can ask or imagine or think, Lord. I don't have words to say that, but I know you are exceedingly, abundantly, super duper powerful to provide more than what I can ask or think. You are at work. And you're at work for your glory. And help me to see that in my prayers. And maybe I find my rest in you and you alone. Thank you, Jesus, for these words that bring us hope in this trying times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.